sensation and taking on mother nature herself. It's kind of a metaphor of life to me. The water is green and pure. It reminds me of innocence. And then you start going down the rivers and they start getting muddied and it reminds me of life as you get layers and layers of experience and problems. And then when you go through the rapids you start spinning in all directions. East, west, north, or south, you get lost. Then it spits you out and you're okay. Then it starts all over again. Take all the winged of the earth, of the air, away. Nothing could survive. If you take all the four-legged away, nothing could survive. If you take all our green relatives away, everything that grows, if you take that away, nothing could survive. But if you take the human being away, everything would flourish. So we are the lowest form of life. When I uh, look at the Grand Canyon, I actually think it might be the world's largest living cathedral. the most terrifying thing, or it could be the most wonderful, beautiful thing. And you just take it and accept it, and make it part of your life, and allow it to transform you in a positive way. The surprise so far of this trip is I didn't know that we might be witnessing the first person ever to try to stand up paddle down the Grand Canyon. Archie Galetta, head lifeguard of Maui, true Hawaiian warrior, is now taking on the Grand Canyon and speaking to its gods. Never stop learning, explore. You want to learn about Hopi 
Zuni, you want to survive, then we take control of our children. We don't allow them into kindergarten. We don't allow them into first grade. We don't allow them anywhere except in our families and our kivas and our teospayas and everything that is sacred and holy and good. We have to be free to do that. And that's the essence of life for all human beings, is you have to be free. If you're not free, you're going to lose everything. And you end up studying it instead of living it. I cannot stand watching my people die. And they're dying because they're not free. What colonization and assimilation means is to strip the Indian of his, of his identity, strip the Indian of his core beliefs and the way that, that they've lived for, you know, hundreds, thousands of years, and create a new Indian in the image of, of that culture. Colonization is uh, a lot of facets. You know, uh, I heard this one guy say one time that, you know the root of the word colonization? The root of the word colonization is the same root as the word colon means to digest. It's the digestion of one culture by another. And it's religious, it's economic, it's military, it's education, it's paradigm. The control, it's about control. Once we speak English, once we're able to have a, a different mentality, then that, you know, that basic policy has, has basically come into fruition, so. Our roles are missing, you know, what, what, uh, what do we do when we don't have a, uh, a job or we don't know our place? This patriarchal system that the U.S. government is really based on has been imposed upon our people and it's really displaced our roles. You said that your grandmother is considered like the second Geronimo or something? What did you mean by that? Who well, this, of this generation. Well, how so? What is her name? And she, I didn't know this. So what, Roberta Blackgoat from the Black Mesa area. She passed on a few years back. Many people consider her the grandmother of the resistance. We have a matriarchy, and for our people, our leaders are our women. And from the time of the Relocation Act of 1974, the Black Mesa area, when 14,000 of our people re relocated, she stayed. She said, uh-uh, you know, the only one that can remove me is the creator. And from that time on, she's inspired so many people. My roots is way down deep. It can't be pulled out. My great-great-grandmother is buried there, and grandmother and my mother, my father and brothers, and even my children. They're just buried just among where I am. I'm just going to remain. That was the beauty of it, you know, just trying to maintain our simple and you know, beautiful way of life. Being on the land. Roberta Black. Roberta Black. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Roberta Black. 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 My grandma can do it better. Huh? She's 90. Grandma can do it better. <laughs> hey. Question. What is a reservation? Uh, what are reserved? A very important construct because people think land that was given to Indians as land reserved and they're treaty. In our case, some places it's a little bit worse off, you know, like, but. So they round up everyone and say this is where you're going to live now? No, that, that work? it depends on the community, but a lot of time, like, they spend a lot of time trying to kill the Indians. Right. And then they say, well, you know what, maybe we won't kill them, we'll just isolate them and we'll leave them there and then we'll just steal everything else, you know. And so then, because first they start, you know, forcing people like the, they put 90, 97 Indian nations in Oklahoma yeah. for the eastern seaboard, you know. And some of those people walk back, you know, walk home. Like in our area, some people like the Ho-Chunks walk home from Oklahoma, walk, walk back. So that's how it's, you know, started. Like that was because they moved from killing to isolation, and then they moved to kind of killing on the reservation. And, and, and Charlie, one thing I want to mention is that all land or Indian territory reservations, those were lands that were deemed useless, desolate, and not rich in minerals or anything to the federal government. 
they thought they couldn't extract anything out of those lands. Therefore, they put the Indians there. And nowadays, they're finding coal all over the Navajo reservation. My grandmother would always say that the coal is the liver of the earth. And all of these elements, the river here, this is the lifeblood, this is the veins, you know, it feeds everything. You know, when you see that for what it is, and you respect it, you know, because it provides so much for us. You know, it's, it's our life. We can't live without water. We can't live without a natural, healthy, functioning ecosystem. So when you take out the coal, you know, what happens if we take out part of your liver or we start removing organs and mining these things, you know, we start, our bodies start to shut down and we, we have difficulty. Black Mesa Water Coalition was started really as a reactionary need to get out and stop power plant proposals, stop the Black Mesa mine that was taking our coal, the liver of our mother, but also the, the water, our sole source of drinking water to provide energy to Los Angeles. We're not only protesting and marching, but we're also trying to do movement building and getting more young people involved. We just got past the first ever indigenous green jobs policy in our tribal government. It will create thousands of green jobs, put food on the table for our families, and give us an option outside of coal mining for our people. Glen Canyon Dam is a hydroelectric dam that provides electricity to major cities around the southwest, including Page, Flagstaff, Phoenix. But yet, about 80% of people on the Navajo Reservation do not have electricity, do not have running water. It's all these big cities have boomed because of water. You go on the Navajo Reservation, the Hopi Reservation right there, the Paiute, the Wallapai, the Havasupai. We are still without electricity and wanting running water. Our water rights are going off the reservation. So, excuse me. So my grandmother has to go 50 miles for water and we have to haul it for her. And, um, from a water source where she has to put in a quarter. This is a common story on the reservation, not just the Navajo. So this is a story that we must remember about this water right here. It's valuable, it's gold. It's gold to people. To us natives, it's life. I had no intention of paddling down this river the whole way. But I kind of got motivated after listening to Nikki when she was crying and she was talking about grandma still has to go get water uh, by bucket. I just I could not fathom that. I was like, this is America. There's no way that's supposed to be happening. I don't know if that's how the Indian people want to live, but I think we have to help uh, improve the standards. Before we go out and help everybody else around the world, you got to take care of your own first. I hope that that'll happen so that grandmas and grandpas and little ones don't have to go down to the river and, and uh, fill up a bucket. I mean, can you imagine that? I cannot. Not in America. That's not right. There's a whole spiritual sense about this river. It's alive. And I don't mean what's under the water. I mean the water. The water is alive.
This would be a brutal environment to live in. Talk about your feet drying and cracking and you're getting yourself sunburned and having to keep yourself hydrated, things like that. But imagine having many generations of families and watching the seasons come and go. I don't think it was brutal to them at all. I think that this is an oasis. so many figures in the rocks, faces, eyes, <laughs> noses. Life itself is just carved in. There's so much wisdom in these walls. Where you live, that's where the Earth is born. And here, she's very old. But there's very few places yeah. in the world you can see the earth being born. Yeah, yeah. Over there. You know, this is the old land and we, we have the new land. And, um, you know, it's so much alive. You listen, listen what you hear. This place is alive. Is there any symbolism to thunder? We're going to be blessed pretty soon. Language is part of the identity. The place is part of the identity. The places I refer to in songs or prayers is my identity. Navajo is my first language. I went to kindergarten first day. I refused to speak English. I didn't want to learn. I didn't, you know, it wasn't, it was new to me. And they tried the second day and then they brought my mom in. They told her, you know, she can't come back until she until she cooperates. She out, right? And I and then so they kicked me out of school until further notice. Indian children have to be put in boarding school at the age of seven and up to the age of uh, 16, I believe. And so parents were actually told, if you don't put your children in, in school, you'll be taken to prison. So they had to take their child to school. And the parents didn't know English. They were just told, OK, this is what will be put your name here, name them here, and, and that's how you were integrated into the boarding school. Laughter, humor, was a way to cope with the trauma of being isolated from your home, from the bosom of your mom. And one of the saddest things that I recall, at night you, you'd hear ch children sniffling, cry. That's real touching. So those are the sad things I remember. Sometimes I feel guilty because I'm not fluent in my language, but I also recognize that so much of that is because of this history of colonization that, you know, <laughs> sometimes I feel real bad that I don't speak fluently. It's a sign of the history. Some of those things don't get passed down because of those things that we have to survive. Our fluency in our language is almost now extinct. Without our language, we cease to be who we are. We cease to be Lakota. We cease to be American Indian. From a cultural aspect, I've known for many years that the issues between the the Hawaiians and the native Indians are, are the same and actually they've been fighting it for a lot longer than we have. So we've, um, you know, we've learned a lot from the, the Indian people. You know, it just gives me chicken skin to um, meet somebody like Larry and you know, he's a walking encyclopedia. He's, he has so much knowledge. You know, in my homeland we call people like that, we call them our kapunas, our elders. Hmm. You know, I just want to thank people like Larry for allowing me to, 
to enjoy the beauty of this place because that's what it's really all about. When you do come to a place like this, you treat it with respect. And you know, even like the ceremonies that we had, like the um, offerings in the morning, we're the same because we do the same thing back home. Every time we pick a plant for human consumption, it is in all of our cultures to make an offering and to say thank you for letting us pick you. And we have to be careful about how we pick. We just can't bunch it up and pull it out. That's rude, that's, that's very disrespectful. We have to pick it in a certain place and pray for it in a different place. Hawaii, the same thing. Hawaii, yeah. it's the exact same thing. When they have uh, the <clears throat> hula ceremonies, mm -hmm. they go into the mountains and they pick the flowers. We make an offering before we even start picking. You know, it's just really strange that we come from almost two different worlds, but we live. Very similar philosophies. The land, the water, the sky, those are our gods. You practice your culture every day, what you do, like me, being in the water, this is me, I'm practicing my culture because I belong in the water. You know, that's where I come from. In our own little way, we gotta practice our culture because in return, that strengthens us as a people.